Good afternoon, Brian Ladd here. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're going to do a little webinar about what we are seeing here in real estate in Bend, Oregon. So it usually takes a few minutes for everyone to uh, jump on board and, uh, and get involved, but I just wanted to give kind of a premise of what we're going to go over today and, and who's here. So we've got Steve LaCrosse. Uh, who is a lead agent with the Lad Group at Cascade House and Sotheby's International Realty. Um, and um, we've got several people helping us behind the scenes. Um, and of course, I'm Brian Lad with, with our group. And we have a couple goals today. One, I want to be respectful of your time. Steve just said before the meeting that this might be the one that we actually get down to that 15 minute mark. We want to be respectful of your time. So the over under bet, I don't know what it is. I was going for no more than 20 minutes. Steve thinks 15. Um, two, I want to have an open dialogue today. So please, we've got a chat function and we've got a Q&A section. Please use those because the more Q&A and the back and forth that we get, the more interesting this will be for all of us. And we can ask answer the questions that you might be more interested in. Steve and I have the... Um, history of getting a little data wonky and Excel cell spreadsheety. And if you want to have specific questions about houses, neighborhoods, trends, things that affect you, please put them in the chat. Please put in the Q&A and we'd be love to address them. Um, number three, what we're here for, we're going to do a quick review on where we've been in real estate um, here in Bend, Oregon. And then we're going to look at some data points that might suggest where we're going. Um, and that's going to be it. So let me um, go to our opening here. Uh, Ronald, would you mind pulling up the poll that we have? We're going to start. I want a little to get some interaction going. Um, let's do a little bit more of a macro question. Over the last 30 years, in relation to household income, do you think that housing affordability has become more affordable, about the same, or less affordable? And um, because obviously we have housing affordability issues here uh, in Bend, we have it nationwide, uh, but I, well, we're, I want to start with a little bit of a historical analysis that will help inform the discussion uh, today. So it looks like we've got a lot of people coming in right now. Um, let's give this poll a couple, maybe another minute, and then we'll publish it and uh, get on with what we have on the agenda today. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to talk through affordability and how that changes, not only with mortgage rates, but obviously also with the prices of homes, with yep. the income and how that you know fluctuates and what percentage of people's income is tied into housing. And so there's so many factors that go into it outside of just how expensive are homes or how much is it to borrow. Um, so it, it's interesting to kind of look at it from that wider, like you said, macro point of view. And then how does that compare? Because obviously the numbers are higher, but what does it look like overall? Yeah, and I'm looking at all these names coming on, Val, Patricia, Casey, John, Gary, of course, Eli, good to see you, Chris, Brian, et cetera. So thanks for all joining us today. But uh, Ronald, would you go ahead and end that poll and just kind of put it up there? Um, yeah, so absolutely. Most people think that thing, housing is less affordable and the data supports that. So let's let's get down to the nitty gritty. What we're looking at right now is an affordability index. This is housing affordability index that goes back to 1990. Um, so while I think 1990 is five or 10 years ago, it's in fact over three decades ago. Um, and what the index shows is that the higher the number, the more affordable housing is. And I even had to look up the definition of the housing affordability index. And it basically has to do with, if you can save 20% as a down payment on a mortgage, does that mortgage pay, payment equal 25% or less of your housing, if you can, of, of your income? If you can perfectly afford a house, you're right at 100. Or if a median, a median wage earner, and they buy a median wage house. And what was surprising is even though housing prices were really high in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, the affordability was actually there because of the historically low interest rates. We kind of had a cheater, even though the housing prices went up, those low interest rates of 2.5, 2.8, 3% kept that housing 
historically affordable. And now this year in 20, or last year in 2023, for the first time, it's dipped below that 100 index. And what that means is that a median wage earner cannot afford a median wage, a median price house. And we all know this, um, but this kind of puts it into data of showing how far we've fallen off over housing as a percentage of our income over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And so this is showing the challenges that we have today in housing affordability. And one of the reasons that buying activity has gone down a little bit over the last year or two, mainly having to do with those interest rates. Steve, does this is does this you know coincide with the conversations that you're having with your clients? Yeah, absolutely, it does. And I was actually reading um, something just the other day talking about where we stand in comparison to you know some of those years even prior to this chart, and we're right on par with right around 1987 in terms of where affordability is equal. And at that time, interest rates were much higher. Homes were a little bit less. People were earning less. Yeah. Um, but that's just, you know, comparing apples to apples, that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, and so we're not going to go over too many macro things. We're going to focus on to Bend and Central Oregon a lot today. Um, but nationwide, how are builders responding to that? One, they're building smaller houses and buyers are going to other product types. They're going to townhomes, they're going to condos and they're buying smaller houses. Smaller houses does not solve the housing crisis, the housing affordability crisis, um, but that's one of the ways builders are responding. And you can see that since January 2018 till now, we've gone on average from about a 2,700 square foot house down to about a 24. So homes have gotten about 10% smaller um, over the last five or six years or so. And builders are continuing to do that because there are maximums of how much someone can afford and it doesn't, and it's it's not option. I can only afford so much. And home builders are trying to respond to that by building smaller, more dense neighborhoods. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways they're responding. And the biggest issue, or here, yeah, and the biggest drop that we saw in that square footage was in 23. And that was really a response was when interest rates went up in 22 and 23, buyers simply couldn't afford any more. And that's when builders started putting on smaller and smaller product. And that really hit kind of mid-23. Um, but more importantly, the biggest factor in this are mortgage rates. Um, Steve, do you want to go a little bit into kind of where we were and where we stand right now? Yeah, you bet. So uh, when looking back, obviously, I think everybody got used to and <laughs> remembers the days of two and a half and three percent. That's two years in the rearview mirror at this point. Um, and so, you know, really what we saw over the course of the end of last year, right at the end of October, we peaked out at about eight percent. And that's that little blip that you see up on the chart. Since then, we've come off. It has kind of hovered in that high sixes, mid sevens range. Now for, for really the, the first part of the year, the end of last year and the first part of this year. And the, you know, the constant chatter is what's going to happen to rates? Where are they going to go? You know, what a buyer who's looking at it now, should they be waiting for lower rates to come? Should they buy now and refi later? And so, um, you know, as you just pulled up, Brian, this is what, this is what the experts are predicting. Obviously, there's always that caveat. We've seen it before. The experts aren't always right. And yep. so for a buyer, it's super important that you're able to make your payments. And if those rates never change, you're able to stay with what you have and make those payments. Um, but but this is what it's looking like. Now, each month, the Fed is obviously looking at the individual data, the jobs reports, the CPI inflation reports, and then they're making their decisions on what banks are charging each other to lend. And that isn't a direct factor on mortgage rates, but it is a factor in people's confidence in the economy. And so as those conversations have, these, these numbers do keep pushing out just a little bit. If we looked at the, esti the estimates earlier this year, we would have seen that they would have expected that we would be there already. So again, when we're talking with clients, the biggest thing is you need to be able to make your payments today, but there, are, there can be options in the future. Yeah, and, and what we're really seeing is that the home buyers are pegged. They can only afford so much, and so they have this hard limit. And, and the biggest impact on that, besides home prices going down 20%, 30 40%, which just is not in the cards, is that interest rate coming down by 20%, 30 40%. And what we're really seeing is that any time over the last 18 months, any time there's been a dip or a sustained plateau in interest rates, the buyers are there waiting in the wings, trying to re-enter the market. And what we're really seeing is that 
right now we're hovering in that kind of low sevens rate. Obviously that depends on your credit and all kinds of things. Um, but what we've really projected is that buyers can afford to get back in the market as we get below 7%. And then buyers will really are going to start to get back in the market in a really strong way when we get to that mid sixes um, on the percentage. And so this might play into your individual strategy of, hey, I can afford these rates, but I still want to wait. You know, we need to have that discussion. Do, you know, do you want to wait till everyone can get back in the market or do you want to get in ahead of them? Or if, if that's the rate at which you can get back in the market, we're going to be tracking inventory with you and we're going to be tracking that along with interest rates and mortgage payments on a weekly basis as these rates hopefully come down over the next year so that we know your entry point um, back into the market. But more importantly, what is this doing to sales prices? And Steve, do you want to go over this a little bit where we stand with median sales price here in Bend? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the median sale price, as you can see here, is up just about 3.7% year over year. Now, if you're watching the headlines, you will hear it's up 5% this month. It's down 5% next month. There's a 10%. And it, and it looks like the, the, that the market is going all over the place. The reality is uh, we're consistently pushing just a little bit higher, kind of in line with what we you know would expect for a nice balanced market. There, there still is that upside demand. We're sitting at, like I said, just over 700. If you go to single families, that's at 765. If you look at average home price in Bend, that's kind of hovering in that 800,000 range. And so, again, you know, when we talk about affordability, that is a that is a tricky number for a lot of people to make work on, you know, a median price or a median income. Um, but the reality is, with the shortage of supply, and there are some slides that we're going to go into on how that is shifting a little bit. With the shortage of supply, you do have buyers constantly coming in the market, waiting for those opportunities. And again, we'll, we'll try to keep this a little bit higher level. We do have our monthly stats and data page on our website, which Jamie and Lucia can share, where we go into the nitty gritty of pending sales and new listings and how the subtleties month to month do play into this. Um, I think, you know, if you could share that in the chat for everybody, I think that would be a really good resource to kind of go into the more minutia. But as I said, we're 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 tracking right along and continuing to hold firm. Yeah, and uh, Ronald, would you mind pulling up the inventory poll that we put together ahead of time? I skipped right over the pricing one. I was going to ask everyone what people thought happened to housing prices over the last twelve months, but we're going to skip over that. The one that we're going to go over to is inventory. Um, and the reason we were going to talk about pricing is that most of the people that we're talking to have a gut feel that pricing is either down or it's going down in a significant way. And what we've really seen is despite, um, you know, a lot of negative headlines, prices are not going down. And we're going to get to that, to the why in that. Um, but let's talk about inventory. Compared to this time last year, are there more homes for sale? Less? Um, and I want to see what you're feeling as you're driving down the streets on the number of for sale signs that are at the end of the driveways. Uh, compared to last year. And let's give that another five or 10 seconds and then let's publish that because I want to go over some data on what we're seeing. Um, you know, what are the numbers showing? So Ronald, could you go ahead and end that poll and publish that? Yeah, so what we're seeing, that's interesting. So about just over a third, almost 40% of the people are saying that they see about the same or less inventory on the market than last year. Um, but then there's about 60% or so saying there's there's more or many more homes available on the market. And what we are seeing is an increase. So nationwide, we're seeing an increase. Um, and actually, um, here in Oregon, we're seeing one of the most dramatic increases in the inventory for sale. Um, statewide, we're up about 13%. And then in Bend, Oregon, using April data, we're up about 25% year over year in inventory. So buyers that are looking have a lot more options to look at and um, it's providing more options and less pressure. So we don't feel that people have to choose from alternatives that don't necessarily meet their needs. There's more to look at um, on a day by day basis. Now, the big question that people are saying is if this many more homes are coming on the market and housing affordability is so low, why is this not crashing prices? And what it's really showing, and what I'd like to do is put inventory in a little bit more of a historical concept because an increase of 25% year over year, 
how does that compare to history? So this is the rolling number of listings that we see on average, a couple hundred new listings per month on average in Bend. And you can see that there's kind of a rolling average that we peak out in inventory usually in June, July um, of every year. And we're up 25% year over year. But what I'd like to do is get a little bit more macro. And this is where the non-data analytics are going to sit back in their seat and turn off the webinar. But hang with me because I think there's a, some, some good things. And I actually got deep into chat GPT, to, GP, GPT is that what it is? and data analysis and regression and overlaying data charts to really dive into this one. Please hang with me. So that inventory that we were just looking at, that's what's shown in red here. And from 2012 to about 2024, we had really low inventory, six months of inventory or less. Right now, we're at about three and a half months of inventory. If we regress and go to that left side of the screen, what we're seeing in blue is the housing prices. And everyone's saying, hey, if inventory goes up, housing prices should come down, right? Now, what are, yeah, the number of homes for sale, if there's a flood of supply, shouldn't prices go down? And what was really interesting is that in 2005, six, seven, inventory started to go through the roof. But the data analysis that I found was that there was not really sustained downward pressure on housing until we got more than 10 months of supply of housing. And what did months of supply of housing mean? It means that if nobody new puts their house on the market, it takes about 10 months to sell those homes. And anecdotally, on a personal basis, that makes sense too, right? If it takes more than 10, 12 months to sell a home, do sellers start to feel desperate and, and do price reductions? Yes. And so what was interesting is that anything below 10 months, prices were either stable or going up. So right now we're sitting at about three and a half months. And so to get to that same equation where housing prices started to go down in 2007, 2008, we'd have to have a triple of the inventory. Um, so up from three months of inventory to three and a half, while statistically that might look you know, a 25% increase in, in inventory. When you look at it in this historical broader prospect, it really shows the depth of the crisis that we had in 2007 and eight and why it's so dramatically different from where we stand now. Steve, how does this resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 right on par with, uh, you know, the support that we've been saying for why is it that prices have remained stable? And it is because that the choices that people have are fewer. There are fewer houses on the market and the buyers still have needs, right? We've talked about this before. We talked about it in my last state of the market. People still need to move for jobs and, you know, graduations and family growth and family shrinking. And so there, there's, there's enough demand that's still there with a limited number of options that you don't have that panicked oversupply feeling that you had, like you said, when you start getting into those eight, nine, 10 month marks. So absolutely. Yeah, and the big difference that we have right now compared to the early 2000s, well, there's done the big differences. One of the big differences, what you might hear be hearing about is the lock-in effect of these interest rates because the interest rates were so low that I think 80 or 90% of uh, mortgage holders right now have interest rates lower than 4%. They don't want to sell that house and give up that interest rate. And so what we're seeing is not a lot of homes coming back to the market. In the mid-2007, 8, 9, interest rates were actually falling. So you know, it made sense to sell it and refinance, even if you lost a little money on the house and et cetera. And it was that big snowball effect. And there, there's just houses sticky right now. And there's not a lot of turnover. We're actually seeing historically low turnover in houses right now. There's a lot of people saying, hey, I want to move from this house to this house. But when they look at the mortgage rates, they're saying, I'm good here for the next 10, 15 years. And so we just see a lot less inventory coming on to the market. And we're going to be real close to our 20 minute mark, but I have three quick slides. Now this is a little off topic on what's happening in Ben, um, but I thought it would be interesting because this is talking about, you know, not only are we talking about there's less turnover in the market, it's who's buying these homes. And what's really interesting is that the millennials right now, they peak buying age is 30 to 35 years. And that's if you look on the millennial chart here, there's quite a few millennials that are in that, but the biggest peak that we have in our population demographic is millennials age 29, 25 to 29. So what this shows is the biggest peak in our demographic history 
is coming into their peak buying years over the next five years. So that shows that there's going to be continued demand. The big, the really interesting thing that I got when I when I dug into this data is that the next generation, Gen Z, they're actually more apt and more prone to buying homes than the millennial generation. And there's a lot of factors for this, et cetera. And buying a home is not for everybody. I, there's a really good case that a lot of people would be better off renting instead of buying their primary residence. Um, but the Gen Z, they're more bought into the American dream and, you know, the financial, you know, the long-term financial rewards and stability of home ownership. And we're starting to see that um, starting to come out. And so they're saying, who are going to buy it? Well, the Gen Z, they definitely have some home affordability crises. Um, but what, the, what was really interesting is that about a third, about 30% of 25-year-olds own their home. And that's ahead of both millennials and Gen Z at this same time. So, well, the millennials got caught in that in-between generation and they had tougher job prospects and they had less stability when they came out of college and they really liked that $9 avocado toast. It's actually funny that the Gen Z is, is becoming the next big wave of home buyers. And so after that, we peaked that past that peak of, of the millennials that Gen Z behind them are showing that they also want to replace. And their population size is about the same percentage of our population as the baby boomers. So a lot of people are saying, hey, the baby boomers are going to vacate the market. The market's going to crash. Gen Z is about the same size as that baby boom generation. So well, if I could just throw in one thing there as well, because you know a lot of my clients have been working with, with people in this age category, and they are very much looking, especially in their early 20s, they're looking at it going, Yes, I could go rent, but I could also go and buy, and then I can bring in some roommates. I can try to make this work, even though the pricing and all of that makes it a little more difficult. They know other people are in that same category. And so you're seeing a lot more of that thought process around, this makes sense for the long term. How do I make it work on the short term basis by having someone help me with my mortgage? And so people are getting creative. Um, and, and I think that's a big, a big thing that, that you're saying right here with the, the people in that age category will do what they can and do what they need to do to try to not miss out on the long-term upside of owning a home. Yeah. And we could do a whole webinar on rent versus buy, because there's a lot of cases where people's personal situations, it actually makes better sense to not take that down payment into a house and to invest it in the stock market and be more mobile and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when you start looking at things in a bigger time frame five plus years, 10 plus years, 12 plus, you know, 20 plus years, it starts to become, um, you know, pretty conclusive data on, on the long-term value of home ownership. And it's interesting to see that the Gen Zers are buying into that. I just didn't, I thought they were going to be reluctant like the millennials, but the data is showing otherwise. Um, but definitely, you know, to kind of put a bow on today's topics, one, affordability is going to be an increasing challenges um, and the mortgage rates will help. But we have to remember that as that helps both, it helps buyers, it's going to bring more buyers back in the market and there's going to be more competition. Um, but hopefully it's going to also bring in more sellers that are reluctant to give up their 3% and move to eight. When that becomes six, you know, the three or four to six is not quite as painful. So we also see an increase in the seller inventory coming to the market. But I think the biggest takeaway is every time these interest rates come down, more and more buyers are going to enter and become competitive against each other. Steve, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is the first conversation that we have with our clients when they say, you know what, maybe I'll just wait for interest rates to come down. You know, we talk through what does that mean? When interest rates come down, what happens to how many people do you think can step in? And we actually did uh, in our last state of the market, which came out maybe two months ago, in the buyer's corner section of it, we charted out mortgage rate activity and pending sales activity. And you can see the two are move in opposite directions. So as those interest rates come down, the market does tick up and more people step in, which then obviously with some competition that does create some more upward movement in prices. So it's, again, th these are high level topics and you know we're glazing over a lot of stuff here. At the end of the day, what we need to do is sit down and talk through your situation, what works, what, you know, and, and how we can look at the factors in the market to, to strategize to get you in the best position. Yeah, we saw one question sent saying, hey, our, how long will it take us to get to that 10 months of inventory that would cause downward pressure on pricing? 
it would take some pretty major events. And based on today's growth, let's say inventory, even if it goes up 25% a year, year over year over year, it would be many, many years. So it would have to be more of a massive economic disruption, political strike, war. You know, it would take some pretty major events to go from three months to 10 months. That would be a triple in our current inventory. So what we're seeing is continued pressure on the limited supply of housing that we have and hopefully a light at the end of the tunnel uh, with some buying affordability coming back through mortgage interest rates as the year to come. So anyways, I lied for 27 minutes. It, I'm going to have to shoot for a 10-minute presentation to get to 20 minutes. Um, but anyways, thank you all for joining. Um, and then as if you have questions about the valuation of your home, you want to create a general uh, strategy session to have a sit down with us to talk about how, you know, this data applies to your individual situation. We're here for you and uh, we'll do this again next month. And if you have any, you know, we're going to send a follow up email to this webinar. If you have any specific topics that you would want us to cover in the future, please let us know. We also have a historical uh, archive of all the webinars from the past on our website. And then we do also deep dive quarterly market updates. Um, and then I think in the chat, we have a download link to our state of the market, which is our twice a year deep data dive. And we actually, um, we'll send that in a follow-up email as well. Thanks, Steve. Thank you all for joining us. There's a lot of great names of people that we know, some people that we don't know, um, but it's much appreciated. And you guys all have a good, good week here in Bend. It's a little smoky from a prescribed burn outside, but Still might try to sneak a bike ride in after work here. Take care. Take Thank care. You.